Welcome to Mershman Seed's Cup of Joe. On this episode, we have two special guests with us today. Mershman Seeds dealer Jeff Reince and area sales manager Brian Reganitter join us on location in Shell Rock, Iowa at the new soybean processing plant that will make renewable diesel fuel from soybeans. Jeff and Brian give an update on northern Iowa crop progress and soybean varieties that are doing well this harvest. Ben and Joe discuss soybean maturity and planting dates, how these are correlated, and the differences you can see at harvest. Joe has some extra corny jokes for you this week. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have Turk and Ben, and Ben, we have some special guests too. Yep, today we have Jeff Reince and Brian Reganator um, on Cup of Joe with us, and we thank them for coming on. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Jeff. Uh, what do we got going on in the background there? We got a lot, looks like we got a construction zone going on behind you. Yes, good morning, guys. Yes, welcome to Shell Rock, Iowa. And what we have in the background is what's really exciting for the farmers in our area is a brand new soybean crush plant being built as we speak. Uh, this was spearheaded by Mid-Iowa Co-op and then with a bunch of other investors. So right here in our back door, we'll have a soybean plant that will be crushing 110,000 bushel a day or approximately 40 million bushels of soybeans a year. Uh, much needed facility for Northeast Iowa. Uh, we've been limited on places to go and the ability at other facilities to get beans there in a timely fashion. So yeah, this is very exciting for us. Tell us what's a little bit different about this crush plant, Jeff. You know, uh, I think I, this isn't just a regular soybean meal plant, right? Correct. What this, uh, something that's new to the industry, but it's been out there, is this renewable diesel. Uh, renewable diesel. Uh, we've heard a little bit about it. I think everybody thought, okay, renewable, bio, it's all the same. Well, it's not. The renewable diesel is actually changing that soybean oil molecularly to be exactly like petroleum diesel. And this plant has already contracted with Phillips 66, will take 100% of the soybean oil that comes from this plant to go into renewable diesel, which is the big push, especially on the west coast is they all have to be under this low carbon fuel standard uh i mean it's just gonna it's a game changer for the soybean industry wow that's impressive so so this this is really going to be kind of a green uh, very green plant you know and uh could be the very future of of uh of where we're going with uh, diesel fuel yes for sure uh, as I was doing a little Googling this morning, finding out a little bit more just here in the last couple of days, there's a, a refinery plant in Louisiana with the REG group that just announced a $950 million expansion to increase their capacity for renewable diesel by about fivefold. So, uh, things are really starting to move in that sector of the fuel industry. Jeff, I heard some uh, rumors, maybe even this, this could be used for jet fuel also. Yes, I'm quite sure with Phillips Petroleum, and I know they're, uh, well, when you're at an airport, you sure see a lot of Phillips Petroleum, Phillips 66 type, type fueling equipment that, yeah, this definitely will fall into that jet fuel too. So if I'm understanding this correctly, this is not going to be any sort of petroleum blend. No fuel at all. It's 100%. Yeah, it's 100% soybean oil based uh, with none of the problems that are associated with the biodiesel, especially in our northern climate. So how many bushels a year will they need to run that plant? They'll need about 40 million bushels. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of a lot of soybeans. Yeah, so yeah, as I did a little research when the plant was first being proposed, 
uh, if we take the seven counties, including Butler County, adjacent to Butler County, basically they need 100% of the soybean production from these seven counties. And then you take, you know, other uses, you know, the seed production and specialty crops. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a big win for the area. Do you have a projection on what it could add to the price of soybeans in, in your area? Oh, I think uh, basis-wise, price-wise, I think it could easily add, oh, 40 to 60 cents a bushel and possibly even more as this renewable diesel really comes on on the mainstream. Well, that's that's really interesting. That Do you have any, any idea how many plants are, are being uh, uh, built across the U.S. to, to meet the demand for uh, green, green soy diesel? I know there's another one proposed over in west central Iowa or near Storm Lake. Uh, and I've read some data where there's uh, 14 to 15 plants will be being built or coming online for this. Well, that's just fantastic news for the demand side for soybeans because, uh, you know, that's what, uh, what keeps the farmers going is uh, the price of soybeans. And, and of course, this past year hasn't been too bad, but previous years has been pretty tough, you know, to, to make a profit yeah. with soybeans. So this is creating that demand is, is in particularly long-term demand. Um, and the fact that we don't have to depend so much on exports for the price, uh, that's a very positive positive news for farmers. Well, yeah, anytime we can keep the product and add that value here in the U.S. instead of exporting the raw soybeans, it's, it's a win-win. Yep. Absolutely. So let's talk about those soybeans, you know, those 70, 80 bushel soybeans that it's going to take to keep those plants full. What, are, what, is, what does crop progress look like right now? What does it look like on your farm, Jeff? And then I'm going to expand out to Brian and, and what his whole Northeast Iowa territory looks like. I'd say crop progress around here is probably approximately a third of the soybeans are harvested and probably getting to about a third of the corn or 25% of the corn. We've kind of went through a rainy, drizzly stretch here. Uh, this is what, October 14th, 15th. Uh, several guys haven't run soybeans since October 1st. Uh, we snuck a few in last week that were running all of 15%, but we could put them in a bin with air. Forecast looks pretty good for next week, so we should be back running soybeans, but... And yields have been, for as dry as we were through the summer, uh, a lot of 65 to 75 bushel soybean whole farm averages. You hear of some plots and yield checks coming in in the low 80s. So uh, just amazing what we, the kind of yields we're getting for the little bit of rainfall we had this year. Yeah, you guys were definitely in the exact opposite boat that we were here in Southeast Iowa. Yeah. You know, we could drown rats sure. in Southeast Iowa and you guys couldn't buy a rain if you had to. So those are really impressive yields. Brian, you cover a little bit bigger area over, or you cover area around Shell Rock, south of Shell Rock and north of Shell Rock. What do things look like? And why don't you give me a few soybean numbers that you've been really impressed with this year so far? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess as far as crop progress is concerned, I kind of concur. I think we're about a third of the way done overall, uh, both corn and soybeans. Uh, yesterday was our first real sunny day. We've had quite a while. Um, and today the sun's peeking through. So uh, as far as varieties are concerned, all of the new varieties just look dynamite. The, uh, the, the new Cheyennes I'm especially excited about, the 2220Es, um, they've really showed out in, in – all field settings we had a few available uh that went into a commercial setting this year that have just uh outperformed my expectations and uh i'm excited about the new chippewas also the new 2223s um as a replacement for the mohegans mohegans have have done fantastic also but yield data that i've seen in the few plots that i've gotten to take out so far uh they're they're really showing up too and then the Chickasaws, the other new one in the, in the mid-group twos, uh, boy, they've uh, they've more than impressed, which, you know, 
Ben, Ben kind of uh, talked those up to me. Um, uh, four or five months ago, he was saying that he really thought that those were going to be the one for, for uh, stressier beans for some of the more variable uh, soil types we see. And, and he's been spot on. So, yeah. A bean that's, I had got a little bit of the new Cheyennes, the 2220s, uh, out to a couple customers and we did one area of them. Uh, very impressive bean. Uh, that, that one's going to be huge for our area also. Well, it's good when we can replace a staple like the 1920s and roll them into the, <clears throat> excuse me, 2022 series and, and, and be as good, if not better, with a little bit better agronomic package that, that, that it's packed there. So we're really excited that uh, the beans have yielded really well um, on this year so far. Uh, we were talking before the year, the plot hasn't came out. How soon do you think your plot's going to come out? I know you got one of the nicer, the nicest plots in our, in our company. You know, you got real long, you got lots of varieties, lots of checks. How soon do you think you're going to be able to get the plots out so we can start talking about results? Hopefully this weekend. I don't know that it'll go this afternoon quite yet, but, uh, forecast looks good. All the beans are mature now that when we were doing beans there last week of September, early October, uh, there's like the Apaches in the plot definitely weren't mature enough yet. But now as soon as the weather allows and we get them down in that 14, 13, 14% we'll be hitting them. So hopefully have some data to you Monday. Awesome. We look forward to that. Hey, one last question for you, Jeff. Uh, what's this Butler County bash thing that we keep hearing about? You know, what's that? <laughs> well, that, that was <laughs> that was a good time. What ended up, uh, I'll try and keep it short, but we had a great new country band formed in the area, kind of out of the Cedar Falls, Waverly, Shell Rock area. A uh, bunch of players from other bands. God, we should... Uh, friend of mine he's a farm bureau agent uh god we should we should have a customer appreciation deal well that kind of snowballed uh we got several sponsors involved along with mershman wiffles iowa corn growers then especially shell rock soy processors wanted to get out to meet people uh our ethanol plant which is right across the road from us here uh, that recently changed to Poet, bought out the Flint Hill, Flint Hills resource uh, ethanol plants. Anyway, the thing all came together and we had it up to our Butler County Fairgrounds on a Saturday night and had just a fantastic turnout. Uh, something, you know, we, we all go to plot days. Some of us agronomy guys like looking at crops. Most farmers just want to come and socialize and this was a great vehicle gave a lot of our in-town people a chance to meet the ag people and it just turned out great and we plan on doing it next year and iowa corn there too yes right iowa there. corn yeah it was a it was quite an event very very special occasion good crowd so well we heard about it down here so it must have been a good time so We'll keep you informed so you can attend it next year. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I want to thank Brian um, Reganator and Jeff Reintz from Northeast Iowa. And uh, you guys have a great uh, rest of your guys' weekend here. And I look forward to seeing what the plot data looks like, Jeff. You bet. Good talking to you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Wow. That, that was an impressive report. And huge demand for soybeans potentially in the future as, as we go more and more green. So that's really good. They that we got a plant going and hopefully more. Yep, we're glad to have dealers like Jeff Reintz up there in Shell Rock and Brian. And if anybody ever wanted to get a hold of Jeff, you know, contact our office and Brian will get you hooked up with Jeff. So, well, Ben, what else do you have this week? I just kind of wanted to touch on maturity just a little bit. We're gonna, you know, keep it short, but like why we spread. I want to ask you a few questions about why we spread maturity out and give you a couple different uh, scenarios. So if I have my Cheyennes, like what they were talking about, and I planted those Cheyennes on, you know, 60 days apart in three different plantings, are those Cheyennes going to act the same? In my opinion, they'll act quite a bit different uh, in some ways, but as a general rule, the rule of thumb is for every week you plant later, it's one day later in maturity. 
Um, and, and again, it depends upon when rain comes. You know, the two most critical times in a soybean's life is the emergence, and that's why we put our, our bonus coat plus seed treatment with Pearl Coat Plus on it, try to get that perfect stand. And then, of course, rain during pod fill. So, um, you know, there's a lot of data to su uh, support that if you plant early, you get more, uh, more nodes. Uh, for potentially hanging pods, but you can offset that if you plant late by putting more population out there because your plants are going to be shorter because soybeans are, are daylight sensitive. They're what we call a short day plant. They start maturing when the days get short. And for example, wheat is a long day plant. It matures as the days get longer. So, th th there, you know, every year you never know when the rains are going to come. So spreading maturities or planting dates, and, I, and most farmers don't like to spread planting dates because they, they don't they, they just soon get it all planted so you spread maturities and that's why we always tell a farmer if you're going to plant uh, if you got a lot of acres you know why not calendarize your your plantings in other words in your maturities so plant your early beans first and plant your full season beans late why do you do that because you get more vegetative growth so are we, what are you seeing, Ben? Are you seeing some questions out there? Yep, we, we, we're getting a s certain number of questions about, well, you know, I have this Cheyenne bean here and it did really well in this field, but it didn't do so hot over here. Why, why is the difference? And a lot of the time it's either planting date or you flip that on the opposite end of the spectrum and you have 2,500 acres that you planted in a week and you run from a 2.0 to a 3.3 and well for whatever reason my three threes aren't doing as well as the beans that that were planted or, or the earlier maturities and that you you basically explained it exactly the way that i would have explained it and the fact that we spread risk because we can plant thousands of acres in weeks now with the size of equipment that we have and not every bean is going to be perfect but you're, what you're doing is you're hedging your bet on having something out of your different maturity groups to make um, something out of your spread of maturity that's going to hit the right rainfall pocket to, to hedge that bet. Yeah, it's, it's no different than baseball. You don't get on base every time, uh, but you know if you get enough batting, you'll you'll get enough chances to get on base. And soybeans the same way. Spread your risk, but really, when it comes to soybean selection, take some time. Talk about with your local dealer or, or with your Mershman representative, you know, what are your limiting factors? Look at your limiting factor. Is it white mold? Is it sudden death? Uh, is it phytophthora? Uh, you know, what, it, what is your limiting factor? Brown stem rot. There's a thousand things that hurt soybean yield. And they always say, the yield goes down as soon as you pour it out of the bag into the planter. In other words, things start going wrong as soon as you pour it into the planter. Your yield potential on soybeans is extremely high and then once you put it in the ground, things start going wrong. So you're right, Ben. Spread your risk, spread your maturities. And, you know, because, you know, I've heard when a farmer says, well, hey, this Kennedy or Cheyenne or whatever it was, that was the highest thing on my farm. I'm going to plant all of them next year. That would be a recipe for disaster. Uh, because if, if you hit the rains wrong or if you hit a disease that comes in, you're, you're going to be unprotected. Correct. Yep. So that's what I had. I just wanted to kind of talk about that because that's kind of what's hot on farmers' minds right now. It seems like we always get a lot of excitement early on in the year. The, the early varieties or whatever they get into first are always their best fields and we get a lot of excitement. And now we start to get questions as we're getting closer to wrapping up or we're getting into the middle to the end of harvest. So it's always good to be thinking about those things. And we're getting into a bunch of double crop beans too, which again, were planted later. Correct. Yep. So that's what I had. Thanks, Ben. Turk? I just wanted to talk about the, the markets a little bit around uh, Columbus Day. The markets will bottom in that cycle every year in the cycles, and we've kind of seen that. Uh, I don't know if this is the bottom yet, but uh, USDA came out with a report this week that was kind of bearish for uh, soybeans and, uh, and corn, but uh, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're, we're at that time of year where we expect the prices to be lower because of harvest pressure and everything else. So it re still remains to be seen where we're going to go from here. But um, by all means, we still have good prices. And I would not uh, be totally upset if I had to take some beans to town because I didn't have enough room in the bin. 
<laughs> well, I would agree, Turk. <laughs> and, you know, uh, costs are going up for next year, so guys are starting to figure out their break-even costs, and it's going to be higher next year. There's no question about it. It looks like, what, $10 on soybeans for is some, some of the experts are saying is going to be the break-even point. So we're still above $10. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's still profit to be made right now. You know, we always want it better, but still not too bad. The only thing I had this week was that there was an article that was put out by No-Till Farmer, and uh, the headline of the article was, EPA doesn't promise dicamba use in 2022. You know, we've been beating that horse pretty hard, and, and, and I know the folks that love dicamba probably don't like me too well, but I just, again, my job is to bring things to you to keep, keep you looking ahead and uh, what changes could come in. But we're going to post that article, and you can read it for yourself. But uh, Michael Regan, the, uh, uh, the EPA administrator, uh, said they're extremely concerned about the potential for dicamba incidents this past year. And so they're preparing to take regulatory action if necessary. So read the article, and uh, I still think there's a very high probability that dicamba post applications uh, could be severely restricted or banned for 2022. And uh, time will tell. Is this uh, in response to them sending questions in or questioning? So th this article is newer than them questioning uh, <clears throat> yes. the EPA questioning the individual companies that have their own dicamba products? This came out on September 20th and um, you know it's posted here at the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture annual meeting and basically this was after they did some initial discussions with uh, the stakeholders about uh, the dicamba off-target movement. So they're trying to get a, a true handle on it before they make a ruling. Gotcha. Good. Well that brings us to uh, the corny jokes and I put a little extra effort in this week, uh, you know, because I know it was kind of a rough week for a lot of farmers didn't get a lot of harvesting done. And, you know, when it starts getting into the latter part of October, then we start getting nervous, you know. So I looked into some uh, what I would call autumn jokes or fall jokes, you know, that would possibly brighten your day. So um, what kind of vest should you wear in the fall? What kind of vest should you wear in the fall? A harvest, okay? Very timely, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. All right, now if you remember your uh, nursery rhymes back in the day, what did, why did Humpty Dumpty love autumn? Why did Humpty Dumpty love autumn? Because Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, okay? He had a great fall. He had a great fall. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Ben. <laughs> okay, here's some more bonus ones for this week. What do you get when you drop a pumpkin? What do you get when you drop a pumpkin? Squash. Yep. Yeah, okay. Now, for you math folks out there, what's the ratio of a pumpkin's circumference to its diameter? What's the ratio of a pumpkin's circumference to its diameter? Pumpkin pie. I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> And the last one, it has nothing to do with fall, but I just thought it was funny uh, from the standpoint, you know, it's one of these math type jokes, you know, again. You're a bus driver on an autumn tour through the park. At the first bus stop, two people get on. The second bus stop, four people get on. The third stop, one person gets off. And at the fourth stop, everyone gets off. The question is, what color are the bus driver's eyes? I no idea. <laughs> well, if you remember what I said, you're the bus driver. Okay. <laughs> okay. See how you point people over there and then really we should be focused over here. It's kind of like farming sometimes, I think. Okay. Sometimes we get too wrapped up by what's really going on to see what's actually going on. Okay. Well, thanks for watching this week or listening on podcast. We sincerely appreciate it. We hope that your family is healthy and you are safe and we'll see you next week.